Chambers of the Occult may contain content that might not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Chambers of the Occult. I'm uh, Jay. I'm Kai. And we have a guest. Disembodied Hi. voice. <laughs> I'm disembodied voice number 13. Oh my god. Oh I, we, okay, you're definitely not number 13, but <laughs> once we get to the 13th guest, I feel like, I don't know, we have Maybe we do something special for that. I don't know. Do we have thirteen guests? Do we? I don't think. I, I don't think we have thirteen people to bring on. To be quite honest, so yeah, I don't know if that'll come. Yeah. but maybe. Anyway, this is Katie. Yeah, Katie, our guest here. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, we thank you a lot for coming back, listening to another episode, uh, another one we're excited to record. Yeah. So. As usual, we've got three stories for you. Uh, true crime, paranormal, whatever Katie's got after, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. So, And I will be starting us off with a fun story that is across state lines. Oh, you, you know, mm. I, I the... F- Go whatever ahead. we call like a true crime, whatever we call a true crime story, like a fun story, it's always like... What is this story going to be? <laughs> you know? Yeah. How fun can they really get? I don't know. <clears throat> now that you say that, I want to call my story a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, okay. <laughs> and I know it's meant to be true crime, but I do think it's a fun story. Um, but before I start the story off, because it takes place across line, like state lines, but also like in the okay. internet, um, I just have a quick question. Have any of you or the listeners ever heard of a website called pogo.com? No. I don't think so. Okay. It's nothing super crazy. It's just like an online gaming site that allows like strangers and like friends to like come together and play like card games, board games, like just online games. Like it's a little get together thing. So users just enter specific rooms in the gate uh in the website of their choice they play games by typing messages to each other it's it's okay. almost like if you're to if you're playing with a friend just you can chat it's the same thing it's nothing crazy got it so the reason i'm bringing this up is because um this story goes back to 2005 so not okay. super old story not <laughs> super recent but- God. So like, I, I like that. I like hearing about like sort of recent, but sort of not cases. Cause I'm like, that was really not that long ago. Yeah. So, um, so this starts with a user on polka.com named Marine Sniper. <laughs> you know, people choose their uh, usernames and they're going to be what they want them to be. Yeah. So Marine Sniper was playing a game of blackjack in one of the poker rooms, and then he received a message from another player going by the username Tall Hot Blonde. (laughs) Nice. This is 2005. (laughs) The username was not taken for them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So Tall Hot Blonde introduced herself as an 18 as 18 year old Jesse. And then she pointed out that Marine Sniper was in the wrong chat room. Because the room that they were in was for teenagers. Uh, and Marine, t- uh, Marine Sniper's profile clearly said that he was 46 years old. Got oh. it. Yeah. Uh, so Marine Sniper quickly reassured Jesse that he wasn't in the wrong room at all. He explained that he was actually 18, just like her. But that he was using his, his dad's account to play 
Um, and that's why the profiles listed him as 46 years old. Uh, because <laughs> it wasn't his own account. It was his dad's. Okay. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, so with this issues addressed, um, Taha Blonde and Marine Sniper were free to just keep messaging each other. Um, and you can probably guess that this is the only only beginning of a much darker story. Uh, because it didn't take long for Marine Sniper. Of course. Yep. It's, I mean, I'm doing true crime. Well, what would be the fun? Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> it didn't take long for Marine Sniper to start sharing more information about himself with Jesse. He revealed that his real name was Tony, uh, Tommy, and that he lived in upstate New York near the city of Buffalo. Uh, T- Tommy had big dreams. Um, he was set to join the Marines like his dad, which would explain the username. Um, and mm-hmm. he wanted to become the best and like the toughest version of himself that he could be. Um, and Tommy hadn't always felt this way because the more that Jesse and Tommy talked, the more he confided in Jesse. Um, and that's when, Je- uh, when he told Jesse that when Tommy was 12, his mother died of cancer. And then after that, he was, he never felt capable of loving another person again. So Jesse mm. was, uh, not Jesse, um, Tommy talked about how after feeling betrayed by a couple of different people in his life, he gradually began to shut off his feelings. He became the loner type um, as far as thinking and talking in, to people in his life. And he confessed to Jesse that when he was 17, um, he, we give a content warning. Uh, when he was 17, yeah. <laughs> uh, he raped a cheerleader from his high school. 80. Okay. Ah. Yeah. All right. So once again, something about being online and not really talking to a person really gets people talking. Uh, mm-hmm. So Tommy explained that he reached like rock bottom uh, and he experienced a sense of total hopelessness. Um, and he found purpose by enlisting in the Marines and he was getting ready to attend boot camp um, in two months time. So Tommy would head to Paris Island in South Carolina to undertake this training. Now, when he opened up and confessed all these things to Jesse, um, Jesse wasn't completely horrified by Tommy's admission that he had that he was a rapist. Um, instead, she felt compassion for what he'd been through, and she even told him that she was proud of the steps he he'd taken to better himself. So she said that she understood that it was maybe from a lack of direction. Um, And Jesse did not live in New York. She lived in West Virginia in a small town called Oak Hill. Um, And her lifestyle was fairly typical. She lived with her parents and younger brother. Um, Although she often fought with her mom. um, And Jesse was passionate about sports, um, playing football, basketball. And she worked as part time as a lifeguard for some extra money. So Jesse had a pretty regular life going on, pretty average. Um, And she was in her final year of high school. She was getting ready to graduate, but she wasn't really sure what she wanted to do with her life. Um, And because she was talking to Tommy so much, she started seeing a possible exciting future with Tommy. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. So I I wonder how that future is going to go. You're going to... You're going to find out. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, Once again, this was all through like the website pogo.com. So they were playing games and just chatting me while they were playing. Um, And during their very first conversation that they started, uh, Jesse sent Tommy some pictures of herself in a bikini. Uh Okay. Yeah. Um, And just as her username suggested, she was tall and athletic. She was. uh... Yeah, she was a tan skin. Tall, hot, blonde. Yeah, and blonde. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's how you know it was 2005 her username matched her person yeah mm-hmm. yeah um, it like wasn't actually like catfishing or anything like no. that's just that was normal like that's what i am and it's what well, you're gonna find <laughs> out because she got comfortable with him real quick and started sending him lots of pictures uh, more pictures followed including glamour shots that she had taken by a professional photographer more casual shots and like candid photos of jesse playing sports um, Jesse even began making photo slideshows for Tommy, set to like background of romantic power ballads like Aerosmith. I don't want to miss a thing. 
So she was getting really invested in Tommy. Um, and Jesse was just curious of what Tommy looked like. So Tommy described himself at, uh, six feet tall, muscular with broad shoulders. And that was something that definitely caught Jesse's attention because she had a thing for big shoulders, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, right. I always find interested. I'm just like, okay. I was like, cool. Um, eventually, Tommy sent Jesse a picture of himself wearing his cadet uniform. Uh, sport like sporting just like a stern expression uh, and Jesse thought he looked handsome so they kept talking and as days went by mm-hmm. Jesse and Tommy chatted more and more they communicated by instant messenger on Pogo as well as email via Yahoo uh, when Yahoo was still used <laughs> wow yeah and then eventually the two exchanged phone numbers and they began, they began talking over the phone as well so when Tommy headed to South Carolina for the boot camp, um, his time became somewhat limited with computers, um, but he always tried to make time to talk with Jesse. Um, it wasn't long before the two te- teenagers declared their love for each other. Um, and their, be- their conversations became a little bit more rare. Um, and of course, eventually they started to engage in cyber sex. Um, whatever that was in 2005. Oh. <laughs> Crazy times in 2005. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I was two years old. <laughs> I was five. <laughs> um, yeah. So we wouldn't know what it was like in 2005. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Not so, at all. Uh, to- no. Tommy and Jesse. I mean, uh, Tommy told Jesse that he had gotten a tattoo on his arm in the honor of their relationship. Um, and that it featured the word always and forever alongside a heart with Jesse's name inside. Um, and always and forever was both a nod to the Marines motto, um, Semper Fidelis, which is just like what the Marines, it's their saying. Um, and it was also like a special saying that Tommy and Jesse would like refer to their love. So like they would make lots of references mm-hmm. to that. Um, so after the boot camp that Tommy was in, um, and it was completed. Um, he received word that he was going to be deployed to fight fight in the Iraq war, um, which the United States had initiated for more than two years earlier. So he told Jesse that his inter- internet access would be restricted during this time and that if she needed to reach him urgently while, she, while he was out in this dangerous mission um, or wanted to send him a care package, that he should do so uh, to his father, Tom Sr., and that's because Tom Sr. Uh, was the Marine contact. Um, so technically, he could receive the packages and then deliver them to his son. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jesse started sending letters and photographs to um, to Tom Sr. Um, but being mm-hmm. away far from Jesse um, and unable to see her in person, it started to show a little bit more of Tommy's jealous side. Okay. Because huh. the less they talked, the more he accused her of flirting with other men online, other men online um, and sending them pictures. So this led to like their first fight as a couple. Um, and mm-hmm. eager to make up, uh, Jesse ended up sending Tommy a special parcel that included a necklace with a pendant in the shape of a half heart. Uh, She kept the other half for herself. Uh, But there was something else in this parcel that is a little odd for someone to send. Um, (laughs) Uh She also sent him a pair of her underwear. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure that lasted well. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) I cannot imagine receiving or sending that to anyone. No, 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 no. Sorry, right, Sergeant. I was late because I was sniffing the panties. <laughs> I mean, the 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 closest thing I could All say. Sorry, right, Sergeant. I was late I because I was sniffing like the panties. In school, <laughs> one time in high school, I was in like art class, and there was this girl who I was friends with that sat next to me, and she just like she like grabbed my backpack. She like put her bra in it, and then gave me back my backpack. <laughs> And I opened it and I was like, I was like, why the fuck did you put your bra in my backpack? Um, 
Did she give a reason? <laughs> no, she just like put it in there, oh. and I was like, okay. Um, and then and I made her take it back. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, that was not nearly as as weird as sending uh, a pair of underwear yeah. in the mail. So continue. And I would imagine it'd be weird if the dad was to open the parcel, mm-hmm. or, like everyone else, and they're like, um, uh. why is he receiving like yeah. undergarment? Weird as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, eventually, Tommy got in a brief argument with his dad, Tom Sr., who actually didn't agree with Tommy and Jesse's relationship. Um, mm. Tom Sr. disencouraged Jesse from pursuing his son any further, telling Jesse that um, he would no longer relay any messages between the couple um, because he thought the relationship should end. Uh, and, and Tom Sr. told Jesse, uh, you will hurt him. Uh, and he's an idiot and will believe your lying ass. <laughs> Holy shit. So at this strong. point, Tom Sr. just doesn't want Jesse with his son. Um, but Jesse, you know, it, it didn't really matter to her because she was in love, sending panties over the mail. Um, so she continued to contact Tom, Tommy, um, telling him that she was worried about his safety while he was fighting in Iraq. And in one message she wrote, I know you're being careful, honey, and you have the best with you, but I also know anything can happen. So I don't know if that's sweet, but it was, I guess it's kind of sweet and realistic, but um, Tommy just kept replying to Jesse, reassuring her that um, nothing was going to happen to him. He also told her about the battles that he was fighting in the Iraq city. Um, I I don't know how to pronounce this name of the city, but he mentioned the cities that he was fighting in. Time continued going by. So as December rolled around, the couple had been in contact for roughly eight months. Okay. That's kind of a while. Yeah. Eight months. So for Christmas, um, Tommy surprised Jesse by proposing to her. Oh, how cute. Yeah. I guess that's sweet, but that's really short. That is, yeah. Um, Especially for someone you haven't met in person. Yes. Yeah. And like Wait, they haven't met yet? Mm-hmm. No, they haven't. No, and it's no, like 2005 and like long distance stuff is just like like unheard of previously pretty much. Like I Yeah. yeah. So unless like you were already a married couple that you know one of yeah them, like, of course but but especially having, like a long yeah like meeting online like that was just untreaded water so yeah Wild. definitely crazy how you can just be so, so trusting of someone immediately like that uh, yeah any, anyway <laughs> and it took a lot less to start sending those pictures mm-hmm. um so Jesse accepted. <laughs> and to mark their their engagement, uh, Tommy sent Jesse some red poinsettia, poinsettia flowers because they were popular during Christmas time. Um, and then Jesse mailed Tommy another care package with more of her underwear. Um, oh. Yep. As well as dog tags engraved with the words Tom and Jesse always and forever. So the couple agreed to get married when Tommy returned home from Iraq. And Jesse wrote excitedly about how she would take Tommy's last name, which was Montgomery. Montgomery. And she also imagined what their wedding night would be like um, and their communications to each other. They talked about how their future together would be incredibly bright. And then two months later, in February of 2006, uh, Jesse received an envelope in the mail. Um, So she opened the envelope because she's been communicating with her fiance at this point. Um, And inside was what appeared to be a family photograph taken by in a professional studio. Okay. There now in the picture was a middle aged woman with a shoulder length blonde hair. She stood in the center sitting behind her was a middle aged balding man wearing glasses and on either side stood a couple uh, stood a couple of two girls who looked to be in their early to mid teens. Along with this photo was a handwritten letter. Um, 
Uh-oh. It opened with the words, Jesse, and close you will find a picture of my family. <laughs> Let me introduce you to the, pe- uh, to the people. The man in the center is Tom, my husband. What? <laughs> no. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's like so, so surprising, but it's not at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So the writer, whoever wrote the letter, uh, explained that her name was Cindy Montgomery and that she was the woman in the picture and that the two girls were their daughters who were aged 12 and 14. Cindy explained that she and Tom didn't have any sons. Tommy, the young cadet, Jesse had been having a relationship for almost a year, didn't exist. Jesse had been speaking to 46-year-old Tom the entire time. Oh, fuck. Should have known. Yep. So, yeah, Cindy had... (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just talking to <laughs> this old man. <laughs> Getting engaged to this old man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So sending your panties to this old man. Crazy. Uh, what is he doing with them? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Cindy, the wife, had uncovered this ruse when she stumbled across some of Jesse's letters to Tommy which Tom had stashed away. So he was trying to hide them. Um, And Cindy was concerned for the young woman and decided to let her know what's been going on. She closed her letter off with the following message. And it said, from what I am pulling from your letters, you are much closer to my daughter's age than mine. Let alone Tom's. Are you over the age of 18? In this alone, he can be prosecuted as a child predator. He's Uh, taking advantage of you. You need to be much more cautious with your safety. You will only be hurt by a man who has mastered the art of manipulation and lies. Do not trust words on a computer. Yeah. Definitely can't. <laughs> and that holds true even today. Like, <laughs> yeah. Especially today. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think people are a little bit more aware of this now. Mm-hmm. But this was 2005. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Thankfully. Um, and as a young man in the 1970s, Tom had actually enlisted in the Marines, but he never saw active combat. By the time that he was distar- discharged, um, he developed a drinking problem. Uh, and then when he married Cindy and they had their first daughter, Montgomery found the motivation he needed to address his addiction. A few years, years later, excuse me, Cindy welcomed their second child. Tom Montgomery became a dedicated father who volunteered for his daughter's swimming club and taught Sunday school at the family church. He provided for his family by working as a uh, mechanic um, for a power tool company with headquarters in New York town uh, in New York town of Clarence. Um, The job didn't engage him the same way that the military did, Mm -hmm. but he made a go of it and became friends with some of his co-workers. So over the years, Montgomery began to struggle again. He had difficulties with erectile dysfunction and his family Lol. and his marriage suffered both physically and emotionally. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonder. Yeah. So communication between him and Cindy dropped to all new low. And that's when Montgomery sought refuge in, on the internet. So he spent countless hours on online gaming rooms, playing games and chatting with strangers because it was easier for him to find comfort and uh, and confide in people he didn't know just via words on the screen. So Montgomery was careful to not share any of this information about his wife or his daughters, but he opened up to some of the problems with other gamers he met. Mm. So... Um, the first time Jesse reached out to him on Pogo, it was in a blackjack room and Montgomery was enticed by the thought of a young, attractive woman. Uh, but when Jesse asked why he was in a room for kids and his profile said that he was 46 year old, Montgomery panicked and he heard about sting operations where like undercover agents would like infiltrate online spaces and, and look for like sexual predators. So out of impulse, he just pretended to be 
an 18 year old using his dad's account. Um, because saying, whoops, my bad wasn't that hard, right? No. Yeah, like I go to a different like game room, like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, yeah. So when Jesse sent him photos of her wearing swimsuits, swimsuits, it's when he was enticed. And he began like creating this character of Tommy so he could keep talking to her. Um, and Montgomery made up some stories about Tommy's past and gave him an altered and troubled like background to help like Jesse sympathize with him. Um, and the photo that he actually sent Jesse was a picture of himself, but it was a picture of him when he was 30 years old in his Marine uniform. So it wasn't a picture of him when he was 18 or 20. He was 30 years old in that picture. So he wasn't sending a fake picture, but he was sending like a really old picture. Yep. Yeah. So as this whole thing started to develop before, like he was exposed, Mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery, like Montgomery battled, like whether he should put a stop to this or not, because he created the personality of Tommy's father to maintain contact with Jesse. Uh, He was trying to kind of distance himself with creating Tom Sr. and having like messages go through him. Um, But he also used this persona to try to break things off with her. When like Tom Sr., like the father was like, you shouldn't be with him. Like you're going to hurt him. Of course, it didn't end up working. So his obsession with her started affecting his personal life and it became a little too strong. So... Um, Montgomery's wife, Cindy, she noticed that her husband had a fixation with the internet. He would often kick out their daughters off the computer so he could use it himself. And then he would stay up well into the night. Um, and the truth was exposed in February of 2006 when Cindy stumbled across a parcel, uh, across a parcel, uh, that Jesse had sent to her husband. Inside was the letter. Some red underwear that clearly had belonged to a teenage girl. Fuck. And of course, yeah, yeah, Cindy was disgusted and horrified. Um, so not only had he been lying to their children, but he was also manipulating an 18-year-old. Cindy wow. confronted her husband. Good. And the okay. couple agreed to divorce. Yep. Uh, in the meantime, Montgomery would move into the basement. That's so, generous. yeah, especially when you find out that this is what's ha- like, you have two children and he's pretending to be like a younger person to talk to an 18 year old. So Cindy, of course, was disturbed by the thought of Jesse blissfully being aware that her young fiance was actually a middle aged man. Um, as a mother of young girls herself, she felt that she had to do something. And that's when she wrote the letter to Jesse and said that on the return address on the parcel. So after Jesse read the letter, she immediately sent Montgomery an angry message telling him that he should be in jail. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Crazy, but good. I support it. <laughs> yeah. Um, she asked uh, Montgomery, Montgomery why he'd done what he did. Montgomery couldn't like provide a satisfactory answer. He said that he wished he could explain it, but he didn't have any answers. He told her that he planned to kill Tommy off by saying he died during the combat in Iraq. But Cindy had discovered the secrets before he had a chance to kill Tommy off. Good. Yeah. So Jesse didn't know what to think. She decided to reach out to a third party who might be able to shed some light in the situation. Um, through the whole eight year, I think it's at this point, it's a year, the, the wow. year that um, she had talked with him online. She remembered that he mentioned one of his friends named Brian, who was also active on Pogo. So she remembered the uh, Brian's username, which was uh, Beefcake1572. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, this is a little funny. Yeah, no, it's great. (laughs) Creative names. Um, So she messaged Brian. Um, He was 22 years old, and his name was Brian Barrett. He was a college student who worked part-time with Tom Montgomery at the factory that he did. 
And he still lived at home with his parents and a 15-year-old brother. So she knew that every weekend, weekday, Brian got up at 6.30, spent the day in college, and then headed straight to work. And in the evenings, that's when he would log on to Pogo at around 10 p.m. So mm-hmm. Jesse sent Brian a message, and she exposed Montgomery for what he had done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian had no idea of this. Uh, he was shocked by his co-worker's actions. Um, and, of course, he provided Jesse with a sympathetic, sympathetic, sympathetic ear. Sympathetic. There we go. <laughs> so then that's when Brian and Jesse began messaging each other. Um, and they started growing closer. <laughs> so Jesse was just Brian's type, um, okay. which good for Jesse, I guess. Um, not only was, she, and then Brian was also attracted to Jesse. Not only was he attracted to blondes, but he also played football and baseball in school. And he found Jesse's athletic athleticism. Wow. Um, very appealing. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> this is kind of the start of a cycle because just like she had done with Tommy, uh, Jesse sent Brian photos of herself. Okay. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Telling him how much he meant to her. Okay. And it wasn't be- too long before Brian and Jesse declare their love for each Gee, other. There it is. <laughs> oh, yep. Yep. Was there more underwear sent this time or? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will get into it. <laughs> okay. Okay. There is some other stuff involved. Got it. Um, but one of the things that they bonded over was the disgust that they had towards Tom Montgomery. Okay. So they would actually go in chat rooms that Tom was often in and they would tell everyone about what Tom had done and they would call him a loser and a predator. Okay. Um, yeah. Fair. And as a result, Montgomery was like temporarily suspended from playing on Pogo. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jesse also shared her login details with Brian. So he would be able to use her account to... And I I get this, mm-hmm. but I also, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm fully on board. Um, but the reason she gave him his login information was so he could log into her account yeah. and send Tom mocking messages. I mean, that's kind of funny, but... Yeah. <laughs> She's getting him back uh, doing the same thing he did. Yeah. Basically. So Jesse and Brian decided that Montgomery's colleagues also needed to know about this incident as well. So they debated how Brian should tell them um, with Brian asking Jesse, what should I say? Mm -hmm. Up to you, baby. She replied, (laughs) (laughs) I have to fuck with them. Brian typed back. You are so bad. Jesse answered. (laughs) (laughs) They're getting freaky. (laughs) (laughs) So that's when Brian started telling people at work what Montgomery had been up to. Because he ended up leaving printouts of the conversations that Montgomery had with Jesse throughout the factory, just laying around. Ooh. So anyone, so anyone could just up. pick it up, read it, and see what was going on. Yeah, he just printed a okay. bunch of them and put them throughout the job. He was not yep. trying to hide it anymore. He wanted everyone to no. know. No. Okay. Yeah. So Montgomery colleagues were like aware that he had been flirting with a much younger woman, um, but. They didn't actually know that it was an 18-year-old teenager that he was flirting with. They just thought, oh, maybe like, you know, like in the late 20s, early 30s, not expecting an 18-year-old. An adult. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah. Um, The fallout was swift. swift. Um, Montgomery sent Jesse a private message letting her know that because of her and Brian's actions, many of his co-workers thought of him as a sexual predator. People no longer trusted him to be around their kids. Yep. Mm-hmm. And as far as Tom Montgomery was concerned, his life had just been destroyed. So he ended up telling both Brian and Jesse to leave him alone, that he would no longer talk to Brian online or when they crossed paths at work. So they just like fucked up his whole life having the info exposed. Yep. Yeah. I mean, hey, that's what he gets. And the the co-workers were aware that Montgomery was talking to a younger woman. They didn't know that by younger woman, he meant an 18-year-old teenager. 
Yeah. Yikes. So because of this, many of his co-workers thought that he was a sexual predator. People no longer trusted him. And they did not want him to be around their kids. Oh, okay. So as far as Tom, Tom was concerned, his life had been destroyed. So Tom just told both Brian and Jesse to leave him alone and that he would no mm-hmm. longer talk to Brian online or when they cross paths in person at work. Now, when Brian told the colleagues um, that he... Brian told some of his colleagues that he was planning to go down to West Virginia to meet up with Jesse. Um, and of course, then he just made it back to Tom Montgomery. So of course, this made him even more upset because he knew that Jesse was a virgin and Tom was fixated with the idea of being her first. And now him here in this, it sounded like she was planning to have sex with Brian. Um, but Jesse wasn't done with Tom because after two weeks of silence, uh, she began to message him again. And she, yeah, so Jesse started saying that she missed Tommy's alter ego. And Jesse explained that she had truly fallen in love with the 18 year old Marine sniper. That she believed he was real. Now, she said she didn't feel the same way about Brian. And she had only flirted with him to get revenge against Mm -hmm. Montgomery. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, the revelation that Tommy never existed, yeah. Had just, like, left him, left her in despair. Because she she thought she was engaged to this marine sniper. He's not real. So, she thought, if he existed, I would still be holding I would still hold him every night mm-hmm. and share dreams with him every night. She was infatuated with the idea of this man that wasn't real. Yeah. I, really flop. Yeah. Oh, here, let me insert yeah. this floppy disk. Oh. I mean, it, like what she said, like it's kind of cute, mm-hmm. but also it's like, damn, like so this person does Tom not exist and you have such drunk like drunk strong in. feelings. <laughs> Um, and then he alternated between making a hostile messages uh, towards Jesse or like messages towards like Got Jesse it. and Brian's relationship. He eventually apologized for having lied to her. And Jesse asked if they could be friends. Tom. Uh-huh. Yep. And the reason for that was because Tom was her only connection to Tommy, who she still loved. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it's going to go um, well. And Montgomery admitted that he missed Tommy too, typing, I still feel Tommy in my heart. God. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so weird. he added that he never stopped caring for Jesse, <laughs> and the two agreed to start over as It friends. definitely does. <laughs> However, this new friendship was a lot more fragile from previous issues. Um, and for starters, okay. it was clear that Montgomery still wanted a romantic relationship with Jesse. So during their long, yeah, during the long late night chat sessions, he sent her self pitying messages about how he wanted to, um, he wanted more than she could give. And whenever he caught wind of Jesse's online friendships with other men, Montgomery would lose that sweet scent like that sweet tone and he would switch it up in an instant he said jesse uh he sent he sent jesse a barrage of messages just calling her like a whore and other like derogatory terms racial slurs yep as he described how he hoped that she would get raped by black men that's crazy that is wild yeah holy shit It's like, yeah, we can be friends, but I'm going to start insulting you when I think you're flirting with other men. So this is when Montgomery started to stalk Jesse's account on social media, networking sites like MySpace. uh, And he grilled her about who she'd been talking to. Um, He reserved a large portion of his rage for his colleague, Brian Barrett. So half of his rage was towards Jesse. Half of the rage was towards Brian. Um, and Montgomery told Jesse, I hate him with a passion and for 10 cents, I would eliminate him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when Jesse replied, that's a little drastic, isn't it? 
Anne Montgomery said, Payback <laughs> is a bitch. Jesse, and I am the ultimate weapon. I am a, I am a Marine. Brian will pay yeah. in blood. Payback is a bitch. Yeah, he was. Technically. Technically. <laughs> Oh yeah, I forgot he is a marine. Yeah. <laughs> so Montgomery also had a confession for Jesse. Forty-six um, year old dad. <laughs> after Brian outed catfishing uh Jesse to their co- to their colleagues, uh Montgomery had seriously considered mm-hmm. shooting him. So this yeah, despite That's the threats healthy. and admissions, Jesse said nothing to Brian. Or the police. Oh. She just kept it to herself. Um, she merely promised to talk to Montgomery and that she wouldn't talk to Brian ever again. So over the few following months, Jesse and Montgomery's relationship fell into a toxic pattern. Sometimes they would get along mm. and even engage in role play when Montgomery pretended to be Tommy again, which is a little weird. Yeah. So... Uh, and then when he pretended to be Tommy, it's when they would fuck? engage in cyber sex again. Um, whatever that okay. was in 2005. Crazy. <laughs> oh, here, let me insert this floppy disk. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's too much RAM. <laughs> oh, no, please. Yes, it probably was something like that. You know. <laughs> um, however, no. during this time, Jesse continued. Yeah, to I wouldn't be surprised. Man. Oh, Jesse. Yep. So Montgomery found out about this through their online community. And of course, he was okay. full of jealousy. Okay. He sent Jesse abusive messages, threatening to publish her address online. Eventually, Montgomery told Jesse that if she didn't leave him alone, she would travel to West Virginia and physically hurt her. Oh, yeah. Jesse. Holy shit. Like, actual, like, physical threats at this point, even though, like, Jesse, I don't know, so many, like, mixed signals from Jesse is crazy. Yeah. He didn't stop. Just by threatening Jesse herself, he also made threats against his mother, uh, against Jesse's mother. Oh. So Jesse backed off, but only for a little while. Uh, she soon reached out again, explaining to Montgomery that her mother Mary wanted uh, to speak to him. Okay. Huh. So, at some point, Jesse told her mom, it's gonna and be interesting. Mary then contacted yeah. Tom, and she demanded that he stay away from her daughter. Valid. So, yeah. Yeah. So Montgomery agreed, but told Mary that he also wanted Jesse uh, to stay friends with him. Mm. Which clearly has not been going well. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Mm-mm. Yeah. So mm. after that conversation with the mother, there was like dead silence, and a couple weeks went by before Jesse messaged Montgomery again. Really? Jesse. Jesse, come on. Girl. Come on, girl. And then that's when he pointed out that her mother had forbidden her from speaking to him. But Jesse just shrugged it off, writing, wow. well, she'll never know. Oh, gosh. Jesse's kind of insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jesse needs therapy. Jesse needs I think therapy. everyone in this story needs therapy. <laughs> yeah, true. I need therapy. Uh, Me too. Yeah, so Jesse had <laughs> promised Montgomery. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> that she was no longer speaking to Brian Barrett, but it would be in September 2006, almost like two years after they started that conversation, um, that Montgomery was looking at Jesse's MySpace, MySpace, MySpace <laughs> page uh, when he noticed something enraging because Brian Barrett was listed as one of her friends and the two had been messaging each other on there. Damn. So Montgomery confronted Jesse again asked if she and Brian were back together and it said I can handle you with I can handle you with anyone but him he messaged Jesse insisted that the two weren't together but they had just talked she said that there was someone else that Jesse had met this new guy who went by the nickname of Shake <laughs> um, <laughs> okay 
Yeah. And she thought that the two of them had something special. Of course, Montgomery didn't believe her. So he was convinced that Shake was actually Brian and that the two were in a romantic relationship. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's well, valid I, to think to like piece that together, I guess. Yeah. So Montgomery also discovered that Brian had plans to drive down to West Virginia in two months and spend Thanksgiving with Jesse. No fucking way. Uh, and he sent a warning that said, you better be very afraid now. Uh-oh. I told you what would happen if you and Brian got together. Oh, dear. Yeah. Now, at around midnight on Wednesday, September 13, 2006, uh, Jesse and Montgomery began chatting online. Jesse repeatedly insisted that Shake and Brian were not the same person um, and asked Montgomery to just leave her alone. She told him, I'm asking you to love me en- enough to let me go. Um, That's Jesse manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I so. Yeah. <laughs> Jess is trying to get out of this. Oh, 100%. But then she keeps yeah. coming back to him. Exactly. Like, That's what like, I yeah. mean. Like it, oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's like high school. So shit. that's when <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Um, so Jesse announced that she was going to delete her accounts on Pogo and Yahoo before signing off with a final message. I love you and will miss you, Tom. Goodbye, baby. I'm leaving now. And at 1.36 a.m., <sighs> Montgomery replied, run to Brian, you whore. He's waiting for you. Um, That's um, ominous. Yep. Four hours later, uh, Tom Montgomery checked back online to see if Jesse had indeed deleted her profiles, which she hadn't. Uh, he sent her several abusive messages, calling her a liar. Then he messaged Brian, stating, your girlfriend is just like you. Nothing but lice. Keep her, f- keep the fuck away from me. You wanted her, you got her. Did did what? Brian respond? Uh Brian. We'll see more of Brian. Okay. Um, oh. On the morning of Sunday, September seventeenth, two thousand six, uh, Brian's parents and younger brother walked through the door in their home in Lockport, New York, and immediately knew that something was wrong. Yep. Uh, the trio had spent the weekend camping with some family members while the 22-year-old Brian stayed at home. Oh, no. But as they walked through, there's no sign of Brian anywhere. And it was clear that the family's cat hadn't been fed in a couple days. Mm. So Damn. this was completely Brian. unlike Brian. Uh, he was quite reliable and responsible. Even if he had planned to go out, he would have made sure to feed the pets. Yeah. So roughly around an hour after they got home, there was a knock at the front door when Brian's father, Daniel Barrett, went to answer it. He saw officers from the local police department sitting there. Yep. Oh, no. So they realized something must have happened to his son. Yeah. Daniel, the father, immediately began to scream. (laughs) Okay. Valid response. I mean, your son is missing. You see cops at the door. Yeah. Um, about 36 hours earlier, at 10.16 p.m. on Friday, September 15, Brian had finished his shift at the at his job. Uh, he punched out. He headed to, towards his uh, Ford Ranger truck, which was parked near the back of the employee's parking lot. He climbed behind the wheel. He was prepared to leave when sharp sounds of gunshots pierced through the air. Fuck! Oh, no! The driver's side window was shot three times, shattering the glass. One of the bullets landed in Brian's upper left arm, while the other two went into his neck. Oh. He was done. He, he was. He slumped over towards the passenger seat and died. Oh, no. Uh, Now, because Brian's family was away and no one was at the factory that weekend because it was the end of the shifts, um, it took two days before his body was discovered. Mm -hmm. The detective found found witnesses who had heard the gunshots 
and seen an individual dressed in camouflage and a ski mask lurk in the area. Marine sniper. Yep. No, not Marine <laughs> sniper. Goddamn. Yep. So this witness, along with Brian's time card, helped to narrow down the time of the murder. Uh-huh. Uh, the killer had, u- had used a .30 caliber carbine rifle. Okay. But there was no sign of the spent shell casings. The only clues up. recovered, yep. The only clues recovered were a gun clip with what appeared to be dog hairs on it and a peach pit. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Which huh. was found laying around nearby. Uh, the police, um, to police, the crime looked like a sniper style shooting. Huh. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my uh, God. Now, Brian's family members couldn't imagine who would want to do harm to the 20 year old. No, yeah, of course. Brian was. Brian was just a young, like man by people. He really didn't have what people would consider enemies. Um, but his co-workers did tell the police about the bizarre online love triangle between Brian, Tom, and the 18-year-old Jesse. So they said that not only had Montgomery been bad-mouthing Brian for months, but he also recently made some disturbing comments. According to one colleague, Montgomery said that if he ever killed someone he'd use an M1A1 military rifle and wouldn't be stupid enough to leave the shell casings laying around. Uh Uh-huh. But stupid enough to say that. Yep. So this was significant, just given the fact that the bullets were found in Brian's body match the type of the rifle that he mentioned. And according to the colleague, uh, Montgomery had also inquired about what time Brian's shift ended. Oh. Oh, so he yeah. was like really like strategizing this. Yeah, he yeah. planned it out for quite a while. Uh, investigators wow. were eager to speak to Tom Montgomery, Montgomery themselves, but they couldn't track him down. Of course, so they began to worry that perhaps Montgomery had left the state to take revenge against Jesse as well. Cross state lines. Hmm. So using a number saved in Brian's cell phone, officers were able to reach Jesse. They called her. Good. Uh, she was safe and well. Jesse confirmed that she had been involved with both Brian Barrett and Tom Montgomery and that she had been increasingly concerned about Montgomery's erratic behavior. Now, according yeah. to Jesse, Brian told her that Montgomery had tried to hit him with his car <laughs> in their work parking lot several occasions. Okay. Yeah. So and none of these people are reporting this. Well, he never spoke or made eye contact with like the person, the person that tried to run him over. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just sat behind the wheel with a, like a stony expression on his face. So he didn't like uh, really recognize him or anything. It was just either that or like he just was, I don't know, like he was like in a trance, just okay. doing whatever he did. Yeah. <laughs> So when Jesse warned Brian that Montgomery was making violent threats at him, against him, uh, Brian asked if she if he should report this to the boss or other co-workers. Jesse didn't reply directly to this. She was simply saying that she was very scared of Montgomery and replied, yeah, me too. He's crazy. So she never actually encouraged him to go report this to like the higher ups. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder why. Yeah. Now, the last that Jesse had heard from Tom was on Friday, September 15th, having finally cut the ties with him two days prior. Yeah. So Montgomery had continued to message her saying things like, hey, whore, you suck. Your boyfriend's dead today. Um, Jesse never replied to this messages. She just left them i don't know if she left them red or like on red i don't know if that was a function function back in the 2005 (laughs) six um so early on friday morning um she awoke to the sound of her cell phone ringing uh tom montgomery was on the other line screaming like obscenities to her like in a wild rage jesse just hung up on him um but he reached out again later that night about an hour and a half after brian was killed Okay. So Jesse received an online message from Montgomery asking, You waiting for your boyfriend? 
fuck. Uh, S- smug son of a bitch. Like, yeah, definitely. Holy fuck. Also, the fact that, like, he was messaging her, like, literally saying that he was going to kill Brian. Yeah. And, like, that's crazy. You're, like, you're saying you're smart enough to not leave, like, your shell casings behind and clean up, but you're leaving this trail of, like, messages saying that you're going to kill this person, and then this person dies. Like, yeah. Okay. Right. No. And you talk about it with your coworkers. Yeah. Like, there's talk about it. Yeah. So hours later, he tried messaging her again, and he sent her a message that said, come on, Brian won't mind you talking to me. Or are you talking <laughs> to your boyfriend? Oh, boy. Yeah. So uh, the officers in New York were worried that Jesse might be endangered. Yeah. Uh, they contacted the police in West Virginia and asked them to visit Jesse at home. It was around 6 a.m. where Officer Lee Kirk and his partner arrived at the address Jesse provided. It was a white house with peeling paint on the sm- uh, with peeling paint in the small town of Oak Hill. They, I don't know if they knocked the door, they ring the doorbell, but they got to the door and a short middle-aged woman with a bob, bob haircut answered the door. Uh, she identified herself as 45-year-old Mary Sheeler, uh, which was Jesse's mother. And the officer asked her if anyone named Jesse lived at the home. Mary replied that her daughter Jesse no longer resided there as she had uh, as she was away at college. Okay. Oh gosh. So yeah. was that like was that like a recent thing that like just happened or I'm not sure. It doesn't really give me a date that it happened, so I can't figure out if it was like, yeah. But according okay. to the mom, um, so she wasn't. She there. was off. On, yeah, she was off to college. Got it. So Officer Kirk reported this back to the police in New York, who told him that they had just spoken with Jesse hours earlier, um, and she told them that she wasn't home. So. Officer Kirk returned to the house and asked Mary if Jesse had been home recently. Mary said no. Uh, she didn't have a phone number for Jesse either. So that's when Officer Kirk found this to be a little hard to believe. Um, he told Mary that they were concerned about her daughter and that she could be in danger and that they needed to talk to her right away. Uh, Mary looked anxious because of what the cops were telling her. Of so course. Officer Kirk, Officer Kirk could tell something was bothering her. And as he continued to press for information, Mary began to cry. And she said, I'm Jesse. I've been using my daughter's name on the internet. No! No way! (laughs) Not both of them! Not both of them! Holy shit! Nobody's real! (laughs) Nobody's real! Except for poor Brian! Except for poor Brian! Holy fuck. So 45-year-old Mary Schiller had been using her daughter's online account to pretend to be her. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like two like 45, 42 grown ass adults pretending to be kids get another kid killed because they... (laughs) Yes! <laughs> a match made in creepy heaven. This shit's insane. They both catfished each other. Oh Holy my God. fuck. Yeah, she said, I've been using my daughter's name on the internet. Um, and Mary would later explain in an interview with Wired Magazine, um, she claimed to have signed up for an account on Pogo to play games as a way of relaxing. Sure. And it was only after paying for, like, the... Uh, paying a fee for a premium service that she realized that she had inadvertently used Jesse's name on the details and was therefore redirected to the site for teenagers for the room of teenagers. Now I'm not sure how simple that was or or how that would happen or why you would use your daughter's name to sign up for an account. That's, I mean, it's, it's 2005 computer technology is still new and you're a 46 year old woman. So like, yeah. Uh, okay i guess yeah right so as they kept talking more to like the cops and like there was more conversations between them mary said mary said that she was happily married to her husband 
and she had no romantic feelings for anyone else. No fucking way. She, so she said she only started, she said she only started talking to Tom, alter ego Tommy, because Tommy seemed troubled and in need of care. Because that's how what? he made himself sound. Uh. So now there is questions that come that rise up because Mary offered no explanation as to why she was sending pictures of her daughter wearing a bikini. Oh, yeah. And then who is Brandy? Engaging in cyber sex with him. That's... Or yeah. why she agreed to marry him. Did she send her underwear or her daughter's underwear? She was sending her daughter's underwear. That is... No! No! Like at the like, this doesn't make it any better. But like, at the very no. least, send your own yeah. underwear, like not your exactly. daughter's. But like, it doesn't make that's. Yeah, I'm gonna leave now. So everything that she had been sending was her daughter's. Yeah, um, and then after learning from Cindy that Tom Montgomery was not actually Tommy, that he wasn't real, uh, Mary said that she became concerned that Montgomery might be talking to other young women online. So that's the reason that Mary continued talking to Tom because she thought if he talks to me, he won't be talking to other young girls. That's actually insane. Yeah. This woman is so not she... real. <laughs> None of them are real. Oh god. <laughs> no one online. She just she was an she was an old lady. She loved the attention she was getting. Like <laughs> this these accusers are like bullshit. Oh yeah. My God. So God. she basically decided to continue talking to him as a way to distract him from talking to other girls. Wow. Um, and as his temper wow. started to flare and he became increasingly jealous, Mary continued to speak to him out of fear that he might harm himself or others if she didn't continue talking to him. So Mary said that she never had feelings for uh, Tom or Brian. She said she had no romantic feelings for either one. Um, she said he was simply a sweet kid who started flirting with her, and she hadn't known what to do with exposing her, tr- what to do without exposing her true identity. You don't need to expose anything. Just stop talking to him. Exactly. No. <laughs> Log off. Make a new account. Isn't Literally delete it. Like holy fuck. <laughs> yeah. So the investigators in New York who had been communicating with quote unquote Jesse were also stunned about this revelation um, about Mary Sheeler who had. You know, sounded just like a teenager over the phone when he called her. Um, so one detective was so disbelieving that he drove down to West Virginia to meet Mary himself. Oh, I don't blame him. I would have done the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact is that Mary and Tom were talking on the phone. This 45 year old people pretending to be teenagers and not one of them caught that they were not teenagers. Because they don't know what teenagers sound like. <laughs> <laughs> no so uh they ended up going through mary's computer because it was confiscated and at this point she had been communicating with tom roughly for a year and a half so wow. they had all these messages hundreds of images um and hundreds of those images were of mary's daughter yeah jesse oh how did she now, how was she getting them yeah here's the thing many oh. of this picture- were clearly taken without Jesse's knowledge or consent. Uh, Some of his photos focus on particular body parts and were taken from behind um, in a video that Mary had clearly filmed without her daughter's knowledge or consent. She aimed the camera right up at Jesse's skirt and then took the footage and mm. sent it to several men online. That's crazy. And she did that for like a year, if not longer. A year and a half, if not longer. And her yeah. daughter just, like, never noticed? What? She never knew. Aww. So she would send this footage, these pictures and videos of her daughter to men online. Um, and she would ask them if they liked it. Oh, God. Disgusting. Um, and, of course, um, she had also sent photos of her daughter and pairs of Jesse's underwear to multiple men online. Online admirers. Bro, what? 
So not just to Tom, but to multiple men. No, that's like actually oh. fucked. Like, like if you take her explanation of like, oh, talking to, to Tom because I wanted to make sure he wasn't talking to other girls because of him, like that is disgusting in and of itself. But at least there was like some sort of purpose behind it. But like, mm-hmm. quote unquote purpose. All this- all this other things, but all this other life. shit. It's like, wh- why are you fucking doing that? You are disgusting, and you do not deserve to be a mother. Like, <laughs> what? No, exactly. No. So Jesse's MySpace page, MySpace page, um, had actually been faked and maintained by Mary, so it wasn't wow. Jesse's real MySpace. Wow. Um, oh, poor Jesse. It, yeah. Investigators also gained access to the chats and logs between them on MySpace on MySpace, um, and hundreds and hundreds of pages documented the countless hours that Mary had spent talking with both men. Now, Montgomery's message made it clear how much he hated Brian for becoming involved with Jesse. He made repeated threats against both Brian and Jesse's life, and it was clear that he fantasized about committing violent acts. Yeah. He talked about how he was a former Marine and how he knew how to assassinate people. Now, eventually, the investigators managed to track Tom Montgomery down. Um, And he hadn't gone down to seek revenge against Jesse after all. After all, he was still in Buffalo. Um, He had just shown up for a shift at at work like normal. So detectives visited him at work and they asked if he could accompany them for, you know, questioning. Yeah. Montgomery agreed but asked if he could go to his car to retrieve his lunch first. He explained that he Mm -hmm. brought peaches and that he didn't want to spoil them by leaving them in the car. Now, of course, detective took note, took note of this because the detectives found what a peach pit Mm -hmm. by. Yep. Mm -hmm. Where Brian Barrett was murdered. Yep. So Tom denied any involvement in the crime, of course. Yeah. He said that on the night of in question, he had gone out to eat at a local restaurant. And he arrived somewhere between 10 p.m. and 10.30, um, at least six minutes before Brian was killed. Now, Montgomery's mm-hmm. wife refuted this, saying he'd arrived home at least half an hour later than he claimed. Wow. In addition to that, cell phone records confirmed that Montgomery was in the vicinity of Diner Braid at the time. So this test, uh, this they also tested the peach pit that was left near to Brian's okay, truck yeah, for DNA, ask. and it came back positive, matching Hell for yeah. Tom Montgomery. Whoa, crazy! Yeah. <laughs> so a guessed? search warrant <gasps> was obtained. How, you know, you get hungry when you commit crime. Clean up after yourself. So he's a murderer and a litterer. <laughs> yeah, this guy just yeah. overall sucks. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, a search warrant was obtained for his family home and they found the computer where they found hundreds and hundreds of pages of conversations between Jesse and Montgomery, as well as photos of Jesse. Mm-hmm. They found the lingerie that Mary had sent oh, pretending God. to be Jesse. Um, and they found them that there were stashed among like Montgomery's belongings. Investigators did take note that Montgomery's family had a pet dog with fur mm. that matched the dog's hair on the, on the gun the clip. clip. Yep. Yep. Uh... So Montgomery also owned several firearms, but yeah. there was no M1A1 rifle in his gun cabinet. However, investigators did find an interesting picture in one of the family albums, an old photo of Cindy Montgomery, the gun cabinet was visible and in the background there was a photo of the m1 rifle yep now montgomery's work items were also seized uh tucked away in the toolbox investigators found a note that he scribed at the diner and it read on january 2nd 2006 tom montgomery 46 year old ceases to exist and is replaced by 18 year old battle scarred marine as he's moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. <laughs> oh God. So, That's so weird. It really is. It's like he's it's like he's writing a book. He's like, yeah, I'm killing myself yeah. off to like be reborn as yeah. this 18-year-old. 
Now, the note also described how 18-year-old Tommy had a black belt in karate, <laughs> uh, 2.5 million in the bank. Oh, and hell yeah. Like a, yeah. <laughs> and looked like a red-headed Harrison Ford. <laughs> That's so funny. Oddly specific. Yeah. I'm sure someone told him that, and that's probably why he wrote it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or that's just how he fantasized about himself. I don't know. Yeah, mm. could be. Now, it appeared that to be some kind of attempt by Montgomery to, like, mani- manifest himself into, like, this entirely different person. Yeah. Um, and as Detective sat Tom down for the interview, they revealed that the woman he killed um, wasn't who Montgomery thought he was. This is when, the re- like, they tell him, Jesse's not real. Um, they oh, told shit. Tom she was a woman around his age who had been posing as an 18 year old, as his 18 year old daughter. Yeah. And as soon as I told him this, the blood drained from his face. <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, so that's <bad. laughs> Oh my God. Not when he got caught by the cops, but when they tell him Jesse is not real. Oh um, my you have, god! You have been talking to Jesse's mother this entire time. He was like, "Fuck! Um, I did this all for some forty-six-year-old bitch." Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, insane. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be on November twenty-seven, two thousand six, that Tom was charged with the murder of Brian Barrett Good. and held in remand. Now. In a recorded phone conversation to his wife, Cindy, from jail, Montgomery simly, seemingly admitted that he had the gun clip, uh, that the gun clip found near Brian's truck was his. So, God, FYI, yeah. those phone calls are being modern. Yeah. Um, he explained that the case had been covered uh, in his dog's fur because his car was filthy. <laughs> Yet he also maintained that he hadn't killed Brian. So once again, he's just not com- coming clean. Um, according no. to Montgomery, Brian had been receiving phone calls at work from people who disliked him. And he believed that one of these individuals must be responsible because Montgomery claimed he didn't mind when Jesse became involved with Brian. He was just happy that she found someone closer to his own age. Mm. No, that's literally, like, deranged. I don't know. Yeah. Nope. Now, as they got closer to the trial date, um, both Cindy and the couple's daughters cut all ties with him. So his wife was just like, I'm out. You're not hearing from me. You're not hearing from the kids. Um, And Montgomery's attempt, he attempted to take his own life. Um, Of course. Not surprising. Yeah. Eventually, he agreed, he agreed to the uh, to plead guilty to first degree manslaughter, and wanted to spare his daughters from his ordeal of the criminal trial. That's why he took the plea. Now, during the sentencing, the judge described the crime as, I quote, a totally senseless killing, the result of a non-existent relationship, a love triangle between three people who did not even know each other. It's a great way to sum it up. Yeah. So Tom was sentenced to 20 years in prison, uh, making him eligible for parole in 2024. No. Do you have any info on that? Nope. (laughs) Okay. What happened to um, Mary? So let me get into that. Got it. So... During one of the interviews with uh, Mary Sheila, which was playing Jesse, um, where is it? Blah, blah, blah. Because, like, she ob- she should have had something happen to her as well, I feel like, like being so involved right? in the situation. Yeah, yeah, so Mary also yeah. spoke about she spoke to media, but she just refused to be filmed or recorded. So it was all like newspaper and like magazines. Um, she said that she wanted to be a good mother. And after her children grew up, she became bored and lonely, leading her to seek company online. She maintained that she only spoke to Tom to prevent him from taking talking to real teenagers. Uh, Mary mm-hmm. intended to write a book about the dangers on the Internet. 
However, uh, Mary never apologized to her daughter, Jessie, or acknowledged that she had done anything wow. wrong. Wow. Uh, she never told her family about what she had been doing, not even after the police came to talk to her about Brian's murder. My now, God. the only re- time she brought it up was when she had to fly to New York to testify in front of Tom Montgomery. Um, that's when she finally told her husband that she had done something bad. Uh, she said that she had been chatting online with two different men who worked together and that one of them just became jealous and killed the other one. Mary insisted that there was nothing sexual or romantic in the conversations and it had just been chit chat about online games Bruh. and weather. Bruh. Oh my God. I, uh, now, uh, <laughs> Jesse did end up finding out about this. Good. Um, yeah. The truth came out with when one of Jesse's friends heard about the case. Uh, Jesse decided to Google her mother's name. Um, and the search returned mm. news stories about Brian's murder, roughly about 400 miles in upstate New York. So Jesse was horrified to discover exactly what had happened and how her mother had used her identity. Not only had Jesse's photos been shared with numerous men, but they had also been splashed all over the internet in coverage of the case. Oh, how, no. I feel like the police should have immediately notified Jesse that her pictures and all of this is out on the internet, was used by her mom. Like, that is insane. What? Yeah. So Find that out through, Jessie like, the news. Ended up telling her father, who was, of course, equally distraught. Um, he divorced Mary, and Good. Jesse cut off all communication with her mother. Good. Good. Now, despite Mary's actions... She didn't no jail time. technically commit any crimes. Yes, she fucking did. What? Sorry. That was loud. That was loud. Um, that was really loud. Dispersal Sorry. of child pornography? Uh-huh. She was 18. Uh, illegal oh. uh, it, uh, explicit yeah. photos without somebody's consent. Um, oh, I bet yeah. they didn't have those laws yet. Oh. 2006. Uh. 2006. Her daughter was 18 at the time. She was off to co- she was off in college. That's why she got away by sending panties because her daughter wasn't home. Um so I know it like sucks cuz like we want justice as on this side as well, but technically she didn't commit any crimes, therefore she couldn't be charged in relation to Brian's murder. Um Tom, however, has strong feelings. He feels that Mary should be incarcerated for the role that she played. <laughs> um <sighs> As do, and Brian's parents also feel the same way about Mary. They're like, yeah, she should be put yeah. behind jail. I mean, I guess it was 2006. There were laws they didn't have that we have now, yeah. But also, I feel like there's something that's got to be in there of being, like, complicit in a murder or some some shit like that that she should have been charged for. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Brian's parents, the Barretts, have also just advocated for laws requiring greater accountability online. So once again, in 2006, there wasn't that many laws in place, but they, you know, they wanted to change that. Um, They remember their son Mm -hmm. as being shy and quiet, despite, you know, his tall statue and athletic built. Um, At the time of his death, Brian was gaining confidence in discovering who he wanted to be. On weekends, he would spend his time volunteering as a coach for a little league baseball team. Brian loved working with kids so much that he decided to become an industrial arts teacher teaching mm. students to work with wood and metal. That's cute. Aww. Unfortunately, um, Brian's father, Daniel, he occasionally blamed himself for his son's death mm. um, because it was Daniel who had found the advertisement for the job um, and encouraged his son oh, to apply. Okay. Oh, that guilt, like from his Boy, dad that. and his parents must be so unimaginable. Yeah, uh, and they they believe that, you know, if, quote-unquote, Jesse had told Brian to do report that behavior to the upper management, that he would still be alive. Oh. Sucks. And that is the story of Tall Hot Blonde, or sometimes known as Marine Sniper. 
that was yeah. kind of insane. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Oh my god. I wanted to switch it up, and I ended up finding you know catfishing gone wrong, and then the catfish mm. got catfished, and murder was involved, and wow, wow, not the way I thought this was gonna go. Like you were explaining it at the start, and I was like, I was like, how is this gonna turn into like a true crime case? You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, there are at least three times I thought you were about ready to finish, and then it just kept going and getting yeah. worse. I was like, oh, okay, especially when yeah, Jesse turned out to be her mother. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Uh, anyway, yeah, thank you. That was a. Uh, you know what? Great. I I guess I would call that a fun case, in the fact that there were so many like emotions. It was like a, a roller coaster going up and down. Yeah. Through. Um, and I just think it's fun that the catfish got catfish. I don't find it. Yeah. It is pretty. You know, honestly, yeah. got killed. There is something um, kind of satisfying knowing that they both were like catfishing each other. Yeah. Right. Cool. So that's yeah. my story. Awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. it. Yeah, no, that was good. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. You ready to tell us about your case? Yes, I am ready. <clears throat> All right. Let's go. So. My story is <laughs> quite a bit different um, than than the Marine Sniper and Tall Hot Blonde. Um, <laughs> so my story takes us to the Whole House Museum uh, located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, H-U-L-L house, not like whole, H-O-L-E. Okay. Um, um. So it was built in 1856 for a man named Charles Hole and his wife, Millicent Hole. Um, simply put, they were rich. <laughs> um, and they had the home built as their summer house in a, quote, rich part of the city. Um, so, you know, they owned it for a time. They spent their summers vacationing there. Um, but eventually, as the neighborhood began to fill with immigrants and became a not so rich part of the city, um, Charles gave the house to his cousin, a woman named Helen Culver. Um, Helen was a real estate developer who would, you know, rent out different properties in the area. Uh, she would eventually rent out the whole house. Um, to a woman named Jane Adams. Uh, do either of you guys recognize the name Jane Adams? <clears throat> I think so. Nope. But I can't tell why. Fair. Are um, they related to John Adams? <laughs> <laughs> no, because this oh. Adams, it's spelled with two Ds, which I find pretty interesting. Oh, okay. A D D A M S. Is this a lady who does the huge thing about education? Yeah. No, that's someone else. Yeah. Yeah. It is her. Okay. So I do know yeah, that. Jane Adams. Um, she was hugely influential, you know, during her time. Um, she became a leader in women's suffrage, um, activism and social services for people, you know, around and within her communities. Um she is widely considered to be one of the country's first social workers and became the first American woman in history to win the Nobel Peace Prize. So oh. she she accomplished a lot during her time, and I think it's really awesome. There's so much to read about Jane Addams, so definitely check out more if you would like. Um, so she had a vision for what she wanted to create when she, you know, eventually got the the whole house property. Um, Jane, along with another woman named Ellen Starr, they co or co founded the Whole House Settlement in 1889. Um, it started out primarily as a shelter for women, especially those seeking shelter from, you know, their abusive husbands, um, as well as shelter for em immigrants coming to the area. Uh, it became a community center that provided, you know, basic health care, daycare for children, English lessons, um, so many other activities. So it originally started out as just a simple, like, mansion that was built for Charles and his wife, Millicent. But eventually, after Jane um, and Ellen got the or were given that property as a whole, um, they just started purchasing all the homes around and they built up this big community, a big settlement where um, they offered so many of these like civic services to their community. 
Okay. It was actually really awesome. <clears throat> it became a, a refuge, you know, meeting center and really one of the headquarters for social change in the Chicago, Illinois area, but also around the world. Um, and so I could go on and on about things. It's really cool. <laughs> But it seemed like it grew. This is not a history fast. lesson. <laughs> it did it grow very fast. Yeah. yeah. So um Helen Culver, the oh lady that God. rented out uh the property to Jane and Ellen. Um so they were initially renting it out, and that's when Jane and, and Ellen started to really build the place up. Um, but they they eventually started getting lots of donations, you know, to build it further and then helen the lady who owned it she just really liked what jane was doing so she just gave her the property and also donated lots of money and backed the project as well so they got a lot of funding pretty quick to really build up this place and uh, make it a huge area um so it got really big uh Today, though, um, because of, you know, development around and it also sort of being purchased by the University of Illinois around there, a lot of those surrounding buildings got demolished and really only the main mansion and like the dining hall still stand. So there's not too much of it left. Um, But yeah, uh, like I was saying, (laughs) this is not a history lesson. Um, (laughs) This is a paranormal case. Ooh. Um, I wish it could be a history lesson, but <laughs> <laughs> does it involve um, the dining hall? Because that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> um, not uh-huh. too much, actually, okay. from what I found. But yeah. Huh. So the this is a paranormal case, and the haunting started even before Jane and Ellen even moved into the place. Um, huh. so. I mentioned, remember, how it was owned by Charles Hole and his wife, Millicent, uh, that lived there. Um, Mm. They lived there for a time, but then in 1860, uh, Millicent, his wife, would pass away inside of the home. Um, That is one Mm. of the things that sort of drove Charles to even, you know, give away the home in the first place. Um, And so when Jane and Ellen moved in... um, Some stories, some information says that the rooms in the house were being rented out to tenants that were already there. Um, So those tenants, if real, as well as nearby neighbors, um, they told Jane and Ellen that stories of a white lady who would wander the halls of the whole house. And this lady was believed to be the spirit of Millicent Hall. Oh, yeah. Is so, there a reason that they thought it was her? Um, not necessarily. Uh, not that I could find. It was just, I think it was that she kind of looked similar to Millicent who had lived there previously. And also, of course, mm-hmm. she was the only person who was known to have passed away um, inside of the house. So they just assumed that. Um, um, she wasn't a particularly evil or aggressive spirit, but there definitely was still some some fear that uh, went along with it. Um, Now, Jane really was not a believer in spirits. She, you know, thought it was more of a a fun kind of folklore thing than anything. She Um, believed in science. Exactly. She did. She believed Mm. in the reality of the world, Um, which really is one of my favorite parts of this story. (laughs) I'll I'll get a little more into that. Um, But... Ellen was a bit more skeptical, I guess, the the partners who founded it. So uh, what the two of them did to protect themselves from this white lady is they would set out buckets of water, like on the stairways and inside in front of their doors. Okay. Um, It was believed that um, the like the old like superstition um, that spirits can't cross through running water. And so... Bucket, oh. but there's still buckets of water. So I uh, <laughs> okay, because um, huh. yeah. I, I knew about the superstition that they can't like cross running water, but I'm like, this is buckets, <laughs> buckets, yeah. And, huh. and that's part of the reason, you know, Jane was skeptical, like I mentioned, and so she was like, whatever, I'll do this because it's kind of fun to think about if it could be a real thing. She was fascinated by it all. Okay, um, so. 
they you know learn to to share this space with the white lady um but it wasn't until 1913 when the the hauntings and the superstitions the rumors really sort of took off um, um it was as um as actually told by Jane herself in a uh, new newspaper article she wrote back in 1916, um, there was what would be called a devil baby <laughs> that would um, huh? <laughs> create That's the stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's this lady who died, but she's not like malevolent. She's just doing her own thing. But there is a devil baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, the devil baby. <laughs> Pretty big jump. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there are a couple different stories that um that are told. There's a couple different ways to look at it. Um the story of this devil baby, it's it sort of varies by like ethnic group in a way. Um okay. so mm-hmm. there's two widely widely uh, believed versions of it. The first one is the Italian version. Um, so it's said that in uh, around the city of Chicago, you know, in the neighborhood, <laughs> in the neighborhood, uh, listeners, you can't see it, but Jay just did the like, like spaghetti, like the, the, <laughs> the hand movement. In the town, in the neighborhood. <laughs> There was a devil baby. <laughs> That's what you meant by different yeah. colors. Okay. Yes. Um, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, um, so this story says that there was a Catholic woman um, who was uh, married to an atheist. Um, and so their relationship was obviously turmoiled and troubled. Um uh, the lady, she put up a, uh, you know, lots of religious paintings throughout her home. Um, and her abusive husband finally had it. And he proclaimed that he would rather have a devil in the house than any Catholic icon hanging on the wall. Um, so that's one. But another one is like a, a Jewish version of the tale. Um, okay. Where it follows the same lines of like an abusive, um, Husband. Angry husband. Um, but this one proclaimed, or this one, he and the wife, they had only had daughters. Um, and so he proclaimed that uh, he would rather have um, the birth of a devil than have another, another daughter. daughter in his family. Oh. <laughs> so, of course. a devil baby was born. It was dropped off. Um, at the settlement house because of its, um, you know, refuge status. Um, the midwives were disgusted. <laughs> they were um, they were terrified. But it was said that this dev- devil baby was taken in by Jane. Um, now, Jane describes this phenomenon herself. It, it happened in 1913 um, in this article that I mentioned she wrote. Uh, it says, quote, The knowledge of the existence of the devil baby burst upon the residents of Whole House one day when three Italian women, with an excited rush through the door, demanded that he be shown to them. No amount of denial convinced them that he was not there, for they knew exactly what he was like, with his cloven hoofs, his pointed ears, and diminutive tail. Moreover, the devil baby had been able to speak as soon as he was born as, and was most shockingly profane. <clears throat> Got it. Oh. So this baby was described as being a little devil, you know, like reddish skin, horns, hooves. Um, it was said that it could speak English, Latin, and uh, Italian fluently as soon as it was born. Um, Jane went on to say that the three women were but the forerunners of a veritable multitude. For six weeks, the streams of visitors from every part of the city and suburbs to this mythical baby poured in all day long and so far into the night that the regular activities of the settlement were almost swamped. (laughs) So would people go see the baby? 
Yeah. So they would knock on her door, they would call on their phone, and they would demand to see this devil baby. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, but, leave yeah. the child alone. The, but I also want to see it. <laughs> Uh, there are some reports that uh, that the devil baby was taken in and then just locked away in the attic to keep it um, away because it was a devil baby. Um, but the reason why I don't believe that happened is because not even Jane herself believes that the devil baby was ever a thing and she was the owner of the place so i mentioned you know she was skeptical um in uh in this letter that or this newspaper article she wrote she detailed how during the time you know when the rumors were spreading she never pushed forward the idea that a devil baby was actually there she constantly denied it Mm -hmm. um she said there was no such thing answering those phone calls but it didn't matter people still were so intrigued into this devil baby and wanting to know of the hauntings there at whole house of course yeah um so yeah eventually that's that's what happened back during that time the the rumors were crazy um and i think that's is one of the coolest things is that like even Jane herself (laughs) just was like, no guys, this is not real. Um, Nice nice campfire story. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Poor Jane. (laughs) So one of my favorite things though, is that this converse, or there were so many people who believed so strongly um, and had such a conviction that this thing was real and that the paranormal was real that um, it actually created like a moral dilemma within Jane as well. She would go on to write more. um, She'd actually go on to write books about it of like, if somebody believes this so strongly, is it going to be of a more of a detriment to tell them the truth or not? Like, should I just let them believe because that's what they want to believe type of thing? Um, Yeah. Shows more of who Jane was. <clears throat> now, the paranormal beliefs were sort of, I guess, shut down. But even still to this day, people are going to believe what they want to believe. Um, of course. He'll definitely still right. believe the whole house is haunted, um, even after everything that's happened. And uh, a lot of people think that maybe the devil baby's not there, but maybe the white lady's not there, but there could be spirits as well. So it is still currently an open museum. People are allowed to um, go in, take tours of the place. Um, and, you know, there I've read recounts from former tour guides, from guests who have said that um, they will go into the house and they'll hear um, a baby crying in the distance of the devil baby. They'll yes. s- see doors slam shut, feel uh, chair, see door or chairs like pulled out from under the tables, um, things like that. There have been also lots of um, stories that of people saying they've captured photos of the white lady on the staircase or even of the devil baby mm-hmm. on the stairs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, how true these pictures actually are. Of course, you know, we'll never really know. (laughs) Um, But I, during this, uh, during researching this a bit, um, I was, I found the, uh, the Watcher video, Watcher Entertainment with Ryan and Shane, uh, primarily from BuzzFeed, or previously from BuzzFeed Unsolved. They actually did go visit um, the the whole house to do an investigation there. It's a fun video. You should definitely check out. Mm-hmm. Um, and now if you don't know about Ryan and Shane, uh, two friends, uh, Ryan Bergara, he is a definite believer. Shane Made, he is a definite skeptic. They go into houses, they investigate. Um, they're pretty funny. It's, there's a good back and forth. They always have, but in this video, it is actually sort of one of the more conclusive investigations that they had. Um, okay. Nothing. Interesting. Yeah. Nothing like outlandish, nothing crazy. Um, Shane fights a ghost. I don't know. He. <laughs> um, yeah. they, All right. 
<laughs> no, so they do lots of investigation, you know, using like spirit box and the SDs method, as well as like a, a REM pod, Ovilus, things like that. Um, you know, during the investigation, they reached out to uh, Jane Adams, um, because supposedly she's there as well. Mm-hmm. They reached out to Charles Hole, to the Devil Baby itself, um, and they got lots of very like cohesive words through their spirit boxes, um, through mm-hmm. uh, good answers, like timely answers through like a uh, like the flashlight, the mag light turning on and off. Yeah. Um, and so once again, you know, it's up, it's up to you to believe and determine what you want. But at the end of the day, it's a very fun video to watch. And I think this is just a, a fun little case about a devil baby um, who maybe should have been treated a little bit better. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it um, doesn't seem like it's doing oh. anything horrible. It's no. I I mean, really, the, the real devil is like the abusive husband who uh, didn't want the baby in the first place. <laughs> there. From, you know, <laughs> e- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, stories of like devil children and devil babies were not, were nothing new back then. Um, one of the explanations I was reading is that um, fetal alcohol syndrome was actually pretty rampant back then because they didn't know, you know, alcohol during pregnancy could affect your child. And so, there are a lot of children born with deformities and people would kind of run wild with those ideas and, you know, make their own rumors, things like that. Um, so I think that is a very plausible explanation for it. Uh, okay. So there is some um, theories of what was happening. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Um, yeah. I mean, there's not, there's not too, too much to actually research or, or put into this story, but um, I ultimately thought it was a fun thing to, to look into and definitely check out the Watcher video about it. Um, the devil baby of the whole house. Um, but anyway, that's my story. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you guys couldn't tell, um, listeners mainly, um, I think most paranormal stories are very laughable. <laughs> because like i just don't believe them most of the time so Fair. um yeah i don't know i think they're fun more than anything so yeah i'm on it. i'm on the side of like i want to believe but in order for me to do so i need like a book thrown at me or something yeah like yeah yeah and when i say like conclusive evidence like in investigations people have done of course, it's not like a demon jumping out at you to show itself. <laughs> it's like, you know, responses to different investigation tactics or tools that, you know, could could actually be indicating something. But who really knows? So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's just fun how we humans try to communicate with it the world. It is. It is. And I think that's something that, like, Jane, you know, really, really realized as well. Um, so pretty interesting the article that she put out is just available to to read through it's a pretty interesting read it's called the devil baby at whole house by jane adams so check that out if you'd like but yeah never heard of the devil baby and i'm glad you brought it up (laughs) i also wanted to sort of i i thought it was interesting um doing a chicago case because one of my cousins like just moved to Chicago like a month or two ah. ago. So I'm going to be like, hey, listen to this. <laughs> you got to check out this check, place. Check out the whole house museum. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Love that. All right. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Now, Katie. Katie, what do you have for us? I feel like you picked the wrong story for this episode. Why? No. No wrong Mine's stories. like really serious. No, no, no. <laughs> you guys have some silly there, ones. There's got to be balance. There's always like the heavy story and then like silly ones. So yeah, you're good. I think this will this will fit. Well, this one I I might I mentioned at the beginning is technically still ongoing, but some definitive rulings have been made on it, which made me feel pretty comfortable talking awesome. about it. Okay. I'm going to take you guys back to the night of October 8th of 2017. Wow. Okay. Recent. Not that recent. long ago. Yeah. Pretty yeah. recent. 
You see what I mean? Yes. Like, there yeah. is still lots of things going that on. That might be our most recent but case. I th- oh, shoot. Might. That we've covered. Okay. I know one case I did had some results that were posted recently, but like it actually Yeah, happened. a few of the yeah. cases we've covered have like recent like updates, but I don't think they've happened as recent as this one. Cool. So probably interested. not. All right. So where are we going? I also like to say a lot. I think, well, before we go, it's, I always like to preface by saying I think oftentimes true crime is focused on individuals with motive. And I think it's good to remember that it's not just individuals who have bad motive. It sometimes can be corporations. Oh, intriguing. And so this is a little bit of a personal story, I guess. Okay. So, yes, I'll take you back to, I guess, the early afternoon, I think, is a better place to start us on October the 8th. It's a fairly windy day in Northern California. In fact, over the 49 counties, 44 of them have been issued red flag oh, sure. warnings. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like California. No one thinks anything of it. Yeah. No one thinks anything of it. There's a constant in, in Northern California yeah. in general and um, generally all of California yeah. to be expected. As many suspected, sometimes there were some rolling blackouts, but widely speaking, no one thought anything of it. You know, a lot of kids tucked in, ready to go to bed as the night was coming to a close. Some people were complaining on social media about the the weather or the rolling blackouts, but overall, it didn't seem like much until around... It was around, I think, 11 when people started to realize, it was about 10 or 11 when people really started to realize something was going on. You see, there had been notification that a a small fire had been started off of what is um, um, Calistoga Road um, in the mountains, so not many people were concerned. But that concern quickly shifted as the fire expanded far beyond anyone's expected size. You see, this fire had more than tripled in spies and all of a sudden was bearing down upon the sleeping inhabitants of the Rincon Valley area, the northern Santa Rosa city. In their desperate attempt to save human life, firefighters were not left to fight the fires, but simply run their sirens as loud as they could and drive through areas, hoping that people wake up, go as many to door to door as possible to get as many people oh. out. And shaken residents only had seconds to run out the door or jump in a swimming pool or make whatever decision they could as the fire was so hot that even the air was catching fire. God. At this point, it had changed from a fire into a firestorm. Oh, uh, for those who don't know, a firestorm is when a wildfire or multiple wildfires mm-hmm. um, create its own wind system. So it basically props itself up and can lead to fire tornadoes, in fact. And the issue is the fire was moving so fast. At that point in time, um, there's a, um, where I'm going to focus is where the firefighters were really focusing on. And there's this place called Fountain Grove. And so what happened is it was a hill filled with very nice um, houses and the firefighters were trying to evacuate from everyone from there. So they sat up base across the highway at the local Kmart. The thing was the fire moved so fast that when one of us, when it's one of the um, other fire trucks from, from the Bay area that had driven up to respond to what was supposed to be a tiny fire, the Kmart where the base of operations was at, was fully engulfed in flame. Oh. <sighs> yeah. Now, and people only had seconds to respond. Most people only had seconds to respond. Unfortunately, there was a significant loss of life. Yeah. Uh, as far as wildfires in California would be considered, there had been one a few years earlier that had seen significant um, loss of life as well. But unfortunately... This one, too, saw the loss of 44 people and the injuries of 129. Oh, wow. Yeah. As mentioned, as mentioned, a lot of people did what they had to and fleed with nothing. In fact, several stories I heard from my friends who did end up fleeing said they grabbed the most mundane things. Because, as mentioned, the next day was Monday, which was a school yeah. day. So a lot of kids grabbed their backpack, 
one of my teachers grabbed her grading supplies. We had had a concert that week, so many of my friends grabbed their outfits for the concert. Got it. Not family photos or treasured memories, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, the fearful part of this is I can tell you all this now, but in the moment, no one knew where the fire was or where it was spreading. No one had even heard of a firestorm at this point in time. All they knew was that there was fire and it was somewhere and it was moving faster than people could imagine. Got it. Now, luckily, after those first couple days, there was some control that was regained. The issue was that wasn't the only fire to start that night. That one I just described was to be named the Tubbs. Okay. Now, not too far below it, not even a full city below it, in a half below it, was another fire, the Nuns Fire burning. So there was... And then about two at the same time. Twenty miles north of it was another fire three. burning called the Pocket Fire. So there's, in fact, there is not just three fires going on. Okay. It is estimated that a total of two hundred and fifty fires within the entirety of NorCal had been ignited that night. No, just North California. Just Northern California, and in a fairly small region. Wow. Now, the reason. I bring this up on a true crime is because the Tubbs fire that I'm talking to you about, one of the worst one essentially of all these fires to occur, yeah. was started none other by PG&E, oh. Pacific Gas wow. and Electric. The very people who had said that they were doing their best to keep the red flag warning. In <laughs> of course. Okay. Now, according to according to this, um, or to following this, um, it was uh, it was it was ruled as faulty faulty equipment that had caused this fire, like many fires that happen in the modern day. The issue is what preceded this. Actually, you see. It was around two thousand seven when the records start to indicate that PG&E had budgeted a certain amount for, for upkeep and in, in maintaining their equipment and power lines, that they started to not need it. In fact, they were underspending. What? Oh. Now, the margin by which they were underspending was small at first. You know, just maybe five, you know, five um, okay. million dollars below. Okay. Just slightly. Until about... <laughs> wow. Just slightly, of course. I think one of the worst years is it, is, it wasn't until the 2010s when it started to really get worse. Uh, about 2013, they estimated they were going to spend $86 million, but they only spent $69 oh, million. that's a huge difference. Wow. And to give you an idea, the year that that fire happened, they pledged to send, spend $60 billion, which is or $60 million, which is less than the 2013 spent amount, but only ended up spending $28 million. Whoa. Wow. That's less than half. Exactly. So you can see a growing trend of mis if not maintaining their yeah. equipment. Now, I mentioned that uh, there were three main fires I wanted to focus on, the tubs, mm, the numbs, okay. and the pockets, because of how close they were together. Um, the tubs was in the middle of it all and did some of the worst damage as far as, um, as uh, um, residential destruction was considered. But all three were happening at the same time, and it is suspected that some of these other fires were also started by them. So, of course, now we have their negligence coming to a point all at yeah. once. Yeah. Now, to be fair, there was significant wind. Um, the wind was peaking at high points at like 85 miles per hour. Okay. Hurricane, yeah. love hurricane yeah. gust wind. That's strong. But nonetheless, it should have been able to maybe not spark the entirety of Northern Cali California to just go up in a tinderbox. Now, one of the other bits that's mentioned is that 
in 2001, um, the PG&E company filed for bankruptcy um, because of, of shortages, because a lot of their power was being um, generated by water, but with the drought, there was not enough water to generate the power. And so they had to purchase electricity from without their reach. And it's good to note that PG&E holds a monopoly in Northern California for yeah. energy. So they went bankrupt. And because they were considered now a public, a privately funded public utility, the state of California decided to step in and say that PG&E can make its decisions about how they want to charge customers okay. and decide if they want to let the customers pick up the bill. Because, of course, they'll totally not yeah. run away with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah stupid. definitely. So while customers were paying normal amounts of money and eventually they start to get their prices raised, PG&E was not utilizing no, that money. Not to at all. Go and fix any of this stuff. Not to fix it, not to update it, um, not clearly going under budget. Now, as you can imagine, the victims of the fire um, I mentioned were, of course, devastated by the loss. None of them could ever foreseen this coming, yeah. at least in their mm. minds. Of course, historic fire maps show that fires have burned through these areas, but you would imagine. Now, considering that the NOAA says that only 10% of fires are sparked naturally, you'd expect that knowledge to be very important mm -hmm. to a company like PG. Is that there was yeah. like 100 so. million expect. fires in North California at the time? Like hundreds? They're injuring that particular. It's called the um, October fires or the wine country fires. It was... 250 yeah. or so. So that higher. means only 10% occur naturally, which means. Which, which, yep, yep. And we, of course, that fire, by the way, all those fires encompass about 245,000 acres. God damn. That's a lot. Which is really hard to imagine. It's just one of those unbelievably yeah. big numbers. So, of course, the residents who were wronged and those who had unfortunately lost family members. I know my mom lost one of her patients that night. But unfortunately, those family members, you know, grouped together and to seek legal yeah, action. Yeah, as they should have. Good. So, as a response, pg e of course, you know, made their public statement, but then decided to fire for bankruptcy. <laughs> what? You no. Know? Again. Again. Because it did once in two thousand one when there was the shortages. And that's when the city or state of California decided to be so kind to them and help them out. How does and yet again PG &E file for bankruptcy? Because it is the monopoly of all of the Northern California energy. You simply can't get rid of that much information. No, like, do what they want. That's why it they're... really is a monopoly. That's why I'm like, you're the monopoly. How like do you file for bankruptcy? Like there's no one else to like come in. And so finally there was a little bit of closure that did occur. In 2018, Cal Fire, a government agency, mm -hmm. investigated an issue of official reports concluding that PG E had caused at least twelve of the twenty seventeen North Bay fires. And it specifically eventually ended up mentioning the Tubbs fire. Yeah. Now, here's the thing that always irks everyone, at least um, that I know today, is that they've only spent a fraction of the money that they've put aside for the fire fund that they had already had built up. And it still continues to be an issue today. One of the things that came out in the court proceedings, though, was in 2014, they found an email stating that there was a likelihood of failed structures happening in um, mm -hmm. being high. And then 2016, PG&E made a request to regulators um, but state, um, to, that they needed to install fresh wires but stated that they would not be replacing any of the lines um, and uh, any of the century old what? towers that connected the line. <laughs> That's... I have no words. Mm. That is so like stupidly negligent. Like, how are you just going to allow all of that? Oh, to make it better. Here is the official PG&E response. 
pg e said it disagreed with the conclusions but Sorry. has acknowledged that the devastation of the 2017 and 8, 2018 wildfires made it clear that we must do more to combat the threat of wildfires and extreme weather <sighs> while hardening our systems. Mm -hmm. As we have disclosed publicly, we are taking significant actions to inspect, identify, and fix these issues with our electric system. Um, and adding, while the number of safety issues we have identified in our electric system is a small percentage, it is unacceptable. <laughs> And again, the reason they filed for bankruptcy, this was before really anything was filed, was ahead of the lawsuit. Oh. But the lawsuits couldn't get the job Of course not. It's, it now, in the modern nice. day... Oh, I was going to say, it must be nice to have money to like secure yourself from these things, to protect yourself. Right. I mean, lawsuits and, you know, people holding you accountable. I don't know if any of you are aware, but now in um, in Northern California, it is nearly impossible to get insurance fire fire really? damage. It is next to impossible because of how frequent fire wildfires are up in wow. Northern California so now. So the companies are just like, so, it's going to happen, and we don't want to pay for it, so we're not giving you the insurance. Correct. You call them, and you're That's like, insane. which is wild. That's insane. It's like you're supposed. Would you say anything about hurricanes? Hold no, Sorry. like uh, oh. it's your job to insure my house for a fire in case of a fire. So steal from corporations. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, it does get worse. Uh, I will I will note that according um in the modern day, um, PG E said it, it will allow regular regulators to monitor its practices for five years, and um. The judge um, had mentioned um, th that within that time period, that even during this, when people would be outed, the tick, um, they would still account the time for energy, and that just proves that even in the modern day, even with being, you know, com you know, pleading guilty to eighty-five felonies, they're still willing to put profits over safety. Of course, uh, and that's the most horrid thing about like so many corporations and the people that run them like they're so out of touch with the reality of everybody and how much of an impact they have on like our safety and they see numbers they don't see lives lost that's all mm -hmm. and yep. now yep one of the greatest devastations welcome to capitalism <laughs> indeed now, I mentioned that a lot of those fires in 2017 were attributed to um, to uh, uh, to to PG&E. This includes, but not limited to, um, the, the uh, Redwood Valley Fire, the Cascade Fire, the Sulf, uh, Sulphur Fire, Cherokee Fire, um, 37 Fire, Blue Fire, um, Norbottom, Abadobi, Patrick Pythian, and Nuns Fires, Pocket Fire, Atlas Fire, and that's just for 2017. Yeah. Because as shocker, things got worse. Of course they no. did. Are you guys... So a few years before that, in in um, 2015, the Butte fire yep. also caused devastation. Yep. It was only a single fire and only two people died, but it destroyed a great section of Amador County. Mm -hmm. And it was residential... But unfortunately, apparently that was enough. So, of course, then in 2017, the fires that I discussed happened. But you would think that after those fires that pg e would do better, right? Mm, hopefully, but uh, we know them. Are you guys familiar with the campfire or the fire that burned um, Paradise? No. no. Wow. Okay. This is the... It at the point this point in history, it was the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history. The Tubbs fire had claimed it in 2017, but just a year later, the campfire had claimed it. Oh, okay. so it's just no matter. As I mentioned, same thing. And for, luckily, this one was during the day, but the devastation was worse. Mm. There had been a fire that had been started. Shocker! By faulty PG&E equipment. Okay. It 
what never the fuck? comes as a shock when that's the issue. The shock is that they still haven't fixed it. Like they continue to let this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the tragic thing though, is that this the fire I first talked about took place in a mountain in a in a, a hill com- community, but it was very well off. And so everyone had transportation and there was plenty of ways to escape. Unfortunately, the town of Paradise is one that a lot of young people move to as a way of uh, uh, making an economic decision to stay in California, but live in an area that Mm -hmm. was more affordable. There was limited ways to escape as the fire turned into a firestorm and ravaged through the city of Paradise killing 85 and injuring 17 <sighs> even even more loss because pg sucks and a year later it always seems same like thing. it's cheaper for them to pay the fine than to fix the issues then as no surprise later a year later the Kincaid fire occurred because of faulty pg and equipment, causing my family actually to have to um, evacuate. And it came within uh, um, half a mile of my house. Wow. Now, luckily, our firefighters up in the Northern California area are much better trained on yes. tactics of how to deal with a fire that size. And thankfully, lives were, no one was lost in that fire and houses were saved. And are very minimal injuries. But that's only because we've had to learn. Yeah, I mean, of mm-hmm. course. And that came half a mile from your house. And, and, for, and fortunately and unfortunately, there has been, at least in Northern California, a break in time of fires. But as you saw recently, there was another major wildfire up near Chico recently. Yeah. And many in Northern California grow weary at this time of year as it marks the start of fire season yeah. when all the greens that got all big and growthful because of the beautiful rains that we had start to dry out and become kindled. Yeah, we, we have all the seasons everyone else does, but just throw fire season in there as well. That's yeah. so true. I mean, one last little thing to sprinkle on because we hate Fiji and E so much. <laughs> um, they switched CEOs as a way of trying to show that they're rebranding. Yeah, I was going to ask but you if course, anyone like, stepped down or anything happened like with the upper people, but they made a big show of it. But it was but a show. I hate. I mean, if that's the case, it should be switching. You know, CEO every single year because the fires just keep on happening, and they're clearly not. So. <sighs> And so that's where we are today. pg e still remains to have a large monopoly over Northern California energy. Prices of energy are still going up as they claim climate change being the sole responsibility for all this change. Aww. And yet nothing has actually happened all that much. Yeah. Now, the workers of pg e are fantastic humans. The people on the ground who oh, work tirelessly to do what they can are the most wonderful people to exist. It is in this case that our true crime focus yes. is those with all the money who only see greed as their own desire. Yeah. Because I'm sure that the people that are actually there doing the work are just not given the resources or time. Yeah. It like it there are so many people that care so deeply about our spaces and preventing accidents and fires and things like this happening. But there's just no power. There's nothing you can do when the people who are calling the shots and making the decisions are so separated from reality and they're sitting in their rich little coves of living where they don't have to experience any of the hardships of life. And it sucks. (laughs) When you're and it happens to- all over. Like PG and E sucks. California, the wildfires are rampant, but like everywhere, it's it's devastating. So, yeah, I will say a small glimmer of hope is that 
within emerging, there's a new field, uh, 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 I should say, a regrowing effort um, to reach out to native tribes awesome. to bring back prescribed burning. Perfect. And so these, unfortunately, it's led, this is what it's taken to get to this point. But it is really nice to see city and county officials as well as state officials embracing traditional tactics in order to preserve the land and keep it healthy. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I think the idea of like prescribed burns are really good. Like part of the reason um, I like I, I, I am like on one of my career objectives is like like park ranger just being involved in like our natural spaces and a big part of that is like wanting to be involved with like prescribed burning and and just mm. conservation because it yeah the state of the world we leave it in right now is is terrible so yes yeah. yeah. but yeah mm. oh yeah quick last little tidbit on the 2017 fire i felt very lucky to be relatively safe mm -hmm. through most of it of course, we could never know Hopefully, where the fire was, yeah. and so that's where most of the fear yeah. arose. But our my cousins evacuated into our house, and unfortunately, they did lose their place of residence. Oh, yeah. um, as about half my high school did, more than half my high school, I mm -hmm. want to say. And then in the 2019, the Kincaid fire um, got really close to my house. And then 2020, the glass fire, which has not been proven yet to have been started by pg and yeah. I want to hope that's only a matter of time but that's just not conclusive yet that one ended up destroying the house that i had been living at at that time yeah. so it's something that is ever present within the lives of people who live in northern california and i think awareness to it is just one of the better ways to help it yes. so that people can vote for legislation yes and make real yes. change yeah. it's one Please. of the things that <laughs> just keeps like bothering me people we don't learn from our mistakes like we could no. write it all down, we could record history, and we still don't learn from the mistakes that people have made. This is like unrelated, but kind of at the same time. I don't know if you guys have seen like been seeing like the memes or the trends going on lately of like Hamilton the musical coming back into play. Because like the like the negotiations, like the political state of like like our candidates now of like Kamala and Trump is like so reflective of what happened with like, <laughs> with, yeah. like back then during Hamilton's I don't know it's super funny um not funny but it's, it's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah we, we yeah. have people who will actually step in to stop yeah. this from happening again I um I just came back from a trip to Hawaii from uh Maui and um Last year in August, um, there was the Lahaina wildfires there in Maui, and um, those that was also one of the the biggest wildfires in the past decade. Um, you know, like 102 people lost their lives during it, and so, um, like, I have family that lives around that area. Uh, luckily, they were mm -hmm. far enough away, but you know, going on this trip, like I, I, you know, I drove through like Lahaina and, and those areas. And even a year later, like it's still so devastated by what the fires did. So many of the houses are just completely burned down. Yeah. Um, like it is very sad to look at. And, um, though the like full investigations, like the foundings findings aren't fully released yet. Um, Hawaiian Electric Company, their version of PG&E, did admit that some of the fires were started because of downed power lines. Um, so, once again, it's like you know, companies refusing to be like proactive um, in 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 saving things as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also just the idea that something we all need is owned by a private corporation yes. and not in the That's public. That's stupid. I don't know. I have thought of that for but a yeah. long time. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. why is this the one legal monopoly that's allowed? Because uh, there's other tiny electric companies that are out there. There is. Electric, yeah, but, like it, you know, so that's why it's not a monopoly. But yeah, uh, it's stupid. Right. I don't know if you guys. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. No, I was also going to mention. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of like the Jasper fires up in Canada um, no. that happened recently. Yeah. So they started in July, which also is insane because um, 
I, I visited Canada in July, Alberta, and Alberta is like, mm-hmm. um, it's like the state, whatever, but it's, it's the right province. There. But I was in Calgary, and Calgary is just a few hours from Jasper where the fires were going. When I got there, you know, the it literally looked apocalyptic. Like the air quality was terrible. It's once again one of the like biggest wildfires that they've had. Um, I actually had a friend who was working um, in Jasper when the wildfire started. And so the fires oh. literally got like right next to him. And so, you know, he had to evacuate. Um, and he literally was like scared for his life along with all the other people around him. So it's crazy. Um, and once again, that yeah. was because of, you know, government management ignoring the warnings that like, hey, fires are going to happen. We need prescribed burns. We need to clear this up before. So I'm just looking it up and that that was a that's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, One thousand acres. Yeah. Like my, my friend who was working in Jasper at this point, he's now back in Jasper working again because oh. it's been enough time. And so he's literally sent me and our other friends like before and after pictures of like mm-hmm. where he was staying um, and like the houses of his friends in those areas. And it's all just burned to the ground. So yeah, yeah. Uh, nature is yeah. a scary thing. <laughs> it, is. it is. Humans are scarier. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that you have like seen like that question that they ask women. They're like, "Would you rather like bump into a man in the forest or bump into <laughs> a, man a, bear? Or the bear. a bear?" And they always pick the bear. Yeah, yeah. that comes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Bear. <laughs> Humans are scary. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for letting us talk, telling about that. I think that was a very much, that was very much needed to hear. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for being on. Of course. Thanks for having me. And thank you for still being here. Like, I am so glad you did not die in that fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> me yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Very scary. So. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening, question mark. Yeah, no. Um, if if you made it this around. far. We started off. If you made it this far. Let's get it went downhill. <laughs> Thank you. No. Um, yeah, once again, I think something we all needed to hear. So thank you, listeners, for being here. Thank you, Katie, for talking about it. Yeah. And thank you. Like always, feel free to like give us a rate. It really puts us out there. If you have questions, comments, concerns, send us a text. Go to the description yeah. and let us know. Reach out. Yeah. Uh, we have gotten some um, comments, responses lately from different people. Um, we will be responding to those very soon. And if you want to get a response, you know, reach out. Let us know. Yeah. We've also gotten a few stories suggested. So send in some stories. We'll, we'll probably <laughs> we'll cover them at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should pick one of them to cover soon. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Being an on again, Katie. And. Thank you. Until next time. Bye. See ya. Thanks for listening to Chambers of the Occult. For photos, sources, and anything else mentioned during the episode, check out our website at chambersoftheoccult.com. You'll find everything you need there if you do find yourself wanting more. You can also follow us on all of our socials at Chambers of the Occult and on Twitter at C-O-T-O Podcast. If you have any questions, comments, recommendations, personal anecdotes, or concerns, let us know. Fill out our contact form on our website, email us at chambersoftheoccult at gmail.com, or leave us a message on our socials. We would love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed what you heard, we would greatly appreciate it if you could drop a like, leave a comment, and subscribe. It is absolutely the best way to show your support, and it would mean the world. Until next time.